This lecture will be about the climatic system, and more specifically, we're going to study climatic changes. A climatic change means that we're going to talk about a time scale, and the time scales in climatic changes can be very diverse because the climatic system itself is made of very diverse components. Maybe the central element is the atmosphere, obviously, because the atmosphere is the system that changes fastest. The average change in atmospheric outflow is 10 meters per second, and this is more than enough to mix the atmosphere within a few weeks or a few months among the two hemispheres. So the atmosphere distributes the climate on the global scale. This is the first factor modulating the climate. But the atmosphere doesn't have much memory, and the greatest memory is in the ocean. The ocean moves at a much slower speed, influenced by the atmosphere, but the speed is 100 times slower. So the ocean is, is a quiet giant, which sometimes becomes alive and acts on the climate and is the timekeeper compared with the atmosphere. There are other components with different time scales, greater time scales, such as glaciers. They have been around for millions of years, most of the time, and there is also the ground under the glaciers, the rivers, and a number of uh, components with different speeds. All of this becomes alive over time. There are time scales which are huge. There were glacial periods that lasted for hundreds of thousands of years, and the history of our planet covers millions of years with the continent drift. So our history is very rich, and we're going to look at something much shorter in terms of time scale. On the second slide, we show a major contrast, the contrast between a period during which our civilizations developed, a stable period in terms of climate, described here with three parameters, three greenhouse effect gases, CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide. And we see that over 10,000 years, our civilizations developed, and this was a warm period, and those gases didn't evolve very much. And at the end of this period, there was then very quick growth of the uh, gas concentration according to the IPCC report, and this is associated with the beginning of the industrial era. Our system is a system where the evolution is even more recent. Here we see that the uh, greenhouse effect gas increase happened after the Second World War. On the next slide, we can see that this is accounted for by the fact that uh, if we look at uh, coal combustion, uh, fossil fuel combustions, the time when this all started and really got out of control is after the Second World War. The system started evolving very fast and got out of control. And if we look at this emission level, CO2, and tropic CO2 emissions, mainly due to fossil fuel combustion. In the 50s, approximately, we talk about one or two million tons, billion tons of carbon per year, and we've moved to six or seven billion tons of carbon per year on the first diagram. This graph I use very often for my lectures. This brings us to the uh, Rio conference 1992, the first conference during which there was an attempt at setting up a UN framework convention to reduce emissions unsuccessfully, and now the emissions have increased, and we're talking 10 billion tons of carbon per year now. So the climate did evolve relatively slowly over large time scales, but we then created a very quick variation speed, space compared with a very long and stable time scale, the time during which our, our civilizations evolved, approximately 10,000 years, which were relatively warm. Now, this must also be articulated with a geography component. 
As I said, the system very much depends on everything that happens in the atmosphere. And one of the atmosphere features is the fact that the circulation is partially organized and partially unpredictable. The organization can be seen on this map, a radar picture of the atmosphere derived from a NASA program to measure uh, rain seen from the space. The white spots show where the atmosphere goes up. There is what we call the uh, black pole, the cumulonimbus uh, clouds on the equatorial belt. On our latitudes, we see vortexes uh, around uh, low atmosphere pressures. And everything is organized on a scale of thousands of kilometers. The atmosphere does not work in a chaotic way. There are things that can be predicted, and this is the reason why we can predict the weather, we can make a weather forecast over a few day, days, but the prediction capacity is limited when we start looking at the regional dimension of climatic changes. Now, more or less, the same can be observed in the ocean. The ocean is organized on a vast scale. There are currents. The Gulf Stream here lies onto the western side of the Atlantic Ocean, the eastern coast of the United States, bringing from the uh, Gulf of Mexico to the Arctic salty, warm waters, which then uh, dive deeper and trigger water circulation. If the climate were to change, and if we have more sweet water in the higher latitudes, the Gulf Stream would probably be pushed upwards, northwards, and we know a number of things regarding the circulation, ocean circulation. We see, for instance, that there are vortexes, a large number of vortexes, and the vortexes are more or less the same that we observe in the climate, i.e. low-pressure areas anticyclones, which were unknown a few decades ago. Space observation has allowed us to see this, and also digital simulation allows us to maybe visualize these uh, phenomena in a more illustrated way. We know that the big stake that we're facing, the big challenge that we're facing is about trying to understand what the future will be in a world we, that we are really uh, giving a hard time to. Many elements are predictable, but many are not, which means that we're going to have to deal with them as if they were climatic risks. And the climatic risk is now an essential component in the political spheres. And we need to um, come to terms with these uncertainties.